<laughs> well, Frank Washington here, uh, doing my best to uh, get, keep myself uh, at least participating in some of the wonderful technology that's available to us sometimes difficult and scary technology. Uh, I have just sent an invitation to John Lowe. My buddy, uh, Tom Probasco is on the road today. At least that's the plan. Hopefully safe travels, Tom. And uh, I'm balancing my life. Uh, between uh, having a little time in the morning before my wife gets up. and My wife is Barbara McNamara, a beautiful woman I love passionately, who is dealing with uh, uh, vascular dementia, which includes memory loss and, and uh, certain cognitive losses along the way. We are trying to minimize the losses and maximize the, uh, the joy in each day. Sometimes that's kind of like a Rubik cube where you move one part and another part moves and, and you, you have to, uh, you have to really work to get to get all your uh, colors together. So, uh, so that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going to see if I can get a little more light on one side of me here. Uh, and There we go. There was a time early in the days of television that a fascinating author and artist named Alexander King had a short-lived experimentation with television and he and I believe it was his wife and sometimes another person or two would wander around, look into the camera, uh, put one camera on another camera, as I recall. And it was just like human meets a uh, TV camera. And, you know, a very relaxed, interaction. Had he known what TV would become, I'm not sure that he would have been so relaxed. But then TV morphed into video and video became possible on cell phones. Think about it. I've got a cell phone here. This little, uh, this little jewel, it's an Apple cell phone, uh, has more computing power. I'm told, I don't, but I'm told it has more computing power than, uh, than what took people to the moon. So, and I don't see John Lowe. Oh, it's not nine o'clock yet, 9.30 rather. Oh, well, that explains that. It gives me a chance to ramble, which is what Alexander King did. He just kind of, you know, talked to the the, the camera and, and or talked to whoever was there. And, and uh, I don't think, I don't think he really understood the power of 
what was happening to replicate and to to uh, to extend his comments or his presence digitally or or and that was analog there but over a, over a distance. I wish that I could re-examine those things. <clears throat> Chelsea St. John sent me a secure message. Corey Tracy sent me a secure message. You wonder what all that's about, don't you? Uh, you know, we shall see what we shall see. Secure messages. Is there anything in this world that's secure? I don't know. Looks like John Lowe. And there comes John. And John's got a few years on me. I'm 81. And uh, here, hello, John. Hello, Frank. I How can hear you off there in the distance. Yes. <clears throat> and so we got through quicker than a lot of times, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I I don't think it's you. It's me doing what I need to do to connect. I have the same problem with the other Zoom meeting that I uh, participate. Well, and, take uh, take your time. Our uh, uh, what we're doing here is old guys playing with media. So yeah. Well, you're you're a better player than I. Well, <laughs> you know, you know, John. I think some of that. Some of that comes with uh, uh, what generation you are and how how soon you started with the, with the media. For you know, I'm I'm 81. Now, how how old are you? 95. 95. So uh, for your age, you are a media guru. A media who? <laughs> a guru, a teacher, a, an expert. You sure it's not Omri? <laughs> <laughs> but how how many how many people of your age even attempt to use the internet? How many are even alive? Uh, yeah, I think I was yeah. thinking the other day. Uh, I'm sure there would be some kind of some kind of an estimate, but I think. How many people are 95 and still living? And uh, now, we, you know, we have someone in our residency who's 104, just was 104. Yes. And um, I wonder how many above her age are still living. <laughs> yes. And and given, uh, I, I think there's a certain disconnect with the, with the uh, greatest activity with the working world uh, for, for most of us, you know, the closer we get to the end time uh, uh, of our lives, the less we uh, concern ourselves with, with what the world is doing. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, I how do you handle all that? Well, you, my uh, attitude is really the opposite of many that you're talking about. And I I find that with what I know is available, let's put it that technically, opportunities that I never had earlier in my teaching career and so forth, I had to go to the library. And Tom would you know, cheer that, I'm sure. Um, and I have to go to the library and have, using the card catalog and the bibliographies and all that sort of thing. And read here, read there, read. Now I can go to YouTube and Google and other pod uh, avenues and uh, get immediate results, answers, ideas from some of the greatest minds in the world. 
and I find this fascinating, and I can't get enough of it. It's it is fascinating, and and, and I I spend a lot of time on YouTube looking at uh, video informative videos. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I watched one last night uh, at the urging of a friend um, who is. His degree is in new media, and he is interested very much in, in what's happening in media and how it affects our future, and he is particularly fascinated with artificial intelligence. Right, right. That's an area that is uh, making everything easier in many, many ways. Uh, almost unbelievably effective and also a great danger as everybody knows and uh, it's like any tool it depends how you use it morally spiritually practically and uh, that's something we all have to decide and work on well and there's also there's what we intend and then there there are the uh Un unanticipated results of what we do. You know, we do things with a particular intended and get unintended consequences. Yeah. Things that are, are basically unpredictable. Um, Yet in, in many ways, uh, we lose touch also of the past. Uh, we arrive at certain ideas, uh, new ventures, this, that, and the other, and yet the same philosophical issues are still there, going back to the ancient minds. So we still stand on the shoulders of giants. And a lot of times we, uh, let's say, I'll, I'll put it, we have an idea or there's a great need I have a relative who was very good at this. She had saw a need and she'd go right out and want to start a crusade, not realizing there how many things were already set up. And yeah. she'd gather money and energies and people together and start a, a new uh, facility. And there was a need there, no doubt of that. However, she didn't realize <laughs> In the very community where she was working in, there had already been organized and well facilitated, um, what would you say, F uh, facilitated tools and, uh, and, and substance that, that were there. And so um, so you, you can take your roots back to, to the, really, I, th I think we, we have to be a bit aware of philosophy. Uh, maybe more than a bit. Well, sometimes we get the idea that philosophy is something that's very uh, intellectual, very abstract, and it certainly can be that. But at the same time, it can be very basic. And the very things that we're facing today, let's take Aristotle, for instance. He would say there are four basic, let's say, drives. There's eros, pleasure, right? Power, says something new, <laughs> power, but he says higher is altruism, thought, thought, thinking for others. And then lastly, God. <clears throat> so we could, we've talked about Plato before. So these are not issues, new issues. This These things run right through to where we are today. Yes. And so we talked a little bit about poetry the other day. Tom, I wish you were here. I'd yes. like to speak to that. But yeah, this beautiful poem, very well written and with a lot of emotion and so forth. But it was really scientism, really based on sort of a materialistic view of reality. Well, I was, I was thinking a little bit along that line and... Um, uh, there was this girl who was in love in her mind and heart with, with James Dean. Remember him? Yes. yes. Dean. She wrote those most beautiful 
tribute to him. I can poetry and so forth. And then she went off and jumped off a cliff. Wow. <laughs> so um, she was so enamored in love, in love, you know, and, and young girl that uh, was really swallowed up in her emotions, you know. And um, so, you know, this is the sort of thing that um, we, um, I think we need to think through uh, the motives, the not only intellectual, but psychological motives and who we are, where we're, what we're doing, what's it all about? Yes. I think one of the great songs is, what's it all about, Alfie? Remember? Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Bert Bacharach, some of the, you know, great lyricists, uh, great lyrics, uh, house is not a ho house without a, home is not, well, if it, house is not a house without, a, unless someone's living in it. And, and so what's a home? And uh, what the world needs today, love, sweet love. And so that's there. I think it's pretty well understood what those words mean. <laughs> I think I'll look that up today and uh, that I, on YouTube and post it to my Facebook. <laughs> what's that? What's that, Doug? Uh, uh, what's it all about, Alfie? Yeah, yeah. That was a very moral movie. Now a lot of people probably wouldn't want to see it. Uh, you know, another movie that I was surprised with was Ten. What's what? Ten. Did you ever see the watch the movie Ten with? Um, what was his name? The comedian that played the piano a lot. Well, Bo Derek, remember her? Yes. She, yes. Well, that was that was ten. Well, this yeah, most beautiful she, girl, you know. She was very beautiful. And a lot of people would oh, not see that. That's that's oh, no immoral movie and so forth. Well, because it typified the most beautiful woman possible and what you would desire in a beautiful lust, uh, lustful woman. Well, the uh, it was a very moral movie though. Very moral. So her husband, she and her husband had an open marriage. They had an open marriage. So they were married, but yet um, they could, uh, you know, have relations with anyone else, married or unmarried. They had no problem as long as they kept them to themselves. You know, their marriage um, loyalty, you could say, is a certain degree. Connection. And Dudley Moore, that was the comedian. Dudley Moore. I hadn't thought of him. And, and like a lot of movies, there could be one or two sentences or in a, bank, a book that you're reading, whatever. One or two sentences will unlock the whole movie. And the, what he said was, the problem is they don't have a problem. Oh, my goodness. That was the point of the whole movie. Hmm. Very basically moral. Well, expand on that a little bit, John. How how is not having a problem a problem? Because they didn't have a problem intermingling with other people, whether they were married or not, and unmarried, unmarried. They had no problem with that, as long as they could stay together. You know, with their whatever agreement they had as uniting, they were married, but they had no problem in communicating with other people sexually. Yeah. And then Dolly Moore. Come, Came up, but he he was fascinated with this girl. That's what he wanted to follow her, and you know, and uh, um, in fact, he was <laughs> I'm push it too far. He was in bed with her, I believe. And they one of the tunes of the of the movie was the Bolero by uh, 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 Ravel. Uh -huh. well, well, the climax of that movie is you know could imagine the climax of the movie was the the song the mu music. Blasting away, you know. Yeah. And then it dawns on Dudley Moore, who's, I don't know what his name was in the play. He said the trouble, is, he found that that was not satisfying. That to him, she didn't have a problem. That was the problem. He discovered his, that it was a problem. A sideways comment on that is that there are some 
spiritual teachers who who have who present the idea that in terms of our spiritual development the obstacle is the way if we don't have a problem we don't have a path because no. it, it is in meeting the problems of the world that, that the world presents to us personally that is our path to the truth there's worse things there are worse things than problems yeah like the absence of a problem in this case, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's that's fascinating. I had not realized that that uh, that it had that movie. Had. Well, another another movie was um, Shades of Grey. I've heard about it. I've I've never had the courage to look at it or whatever. Well, but it's a very moral movie, and and story, very moral. It had to do of sadism and masochism. And he gradually seduces her and invites her, uh, introduces her to sadism and she, her uh, receptivism on the other side. And then she finally, after great struggle, overcomes it and realizes the mistake. But you see, you would not see that. You would watch that because that's you know, and I had the same feeling. I had, a, I, I was even criticizing my daughter because she um, somehow didn't uh, reject it. And then, as I saw the movie, I found that that was uh, it was a real moral there. That is fascinating. Yeah, it uh, that sort of thing. Uh, isn't it, it's a, a kind of a dead end uh you mean sadism yeah any, Methodism, any, yeah just just turning yourself over to uh, uh uh and he was very seductive he had every reason to make it appealing to her you know and he had money and he was good looking and and yet he was introducing her to more and more a little more of these tactics these devices and uh, it was pulling her in. And then I forget how she came to realize this is wrong. And then she had problems. I think she moved away from it and was therefore liberated from the, the thing that was beginning to act as, uh, as tentacle to, to pull her in. Where, where, whereby she would probably lose maybe any will to do otherwise. Yeah. Well, that as we look at it, uh, I, I watched a sermon yesterday on uh, uh, on the computer from uh, Muncie. I'm I'm I would like to move to Muncie, and matter of fact, I'm planning on it at really? some, at some uh -huh. point. Uh, I I have a granddaughter there, and. Uh, uh, Barbara's daughter and granddaughter are up there, and great grandchildren, uh, young young grandch great grandchildren, and so uh, they are attending Union uh, Chapel uh, uh, Ministries, and it's a it's a church with a lot of young people, John, and you don't see that everywhere, and I'm not sure how they managed to accomplish that, but the the pastor delivered a sermon uh, and he, he said, Christ calls us to peace, but not necessarily comfort. And- Or prosperity. Or prosperity. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's uh, pulling a lot of people in, you know, you will benefit economically and just, you know, the, where's the cross? That's what I, that's what I raise. Well, there, there is that question and he will give you what you need to do what he wants you to do. 
He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. But we have to subject ourselves to his intention. And I do think that people that are honest, uh, follow the commandments of uh, loving people, uh, if they're fair and uh, sensitive to other needs of people, they will. Do, there's a certain sense of prosperity there. I think they will do well if you're honest, and um, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I I think that if, if but but, if, yeah, but to say that God's going to bless you, you know, give you special uh, benefits because of this, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I I. Uh... I, I I liked his message, and and that basically his message is we are we are called to do God's will and find peace doing God's will, and and we may or may not be comfortable at any given time while we are doing it. Although we can be comforted because Jesus yeah. did it say he was going to leave. The Comforter, yes, Holy Spirit. So, uh, the com you know, if you have a mountain to climb, if that is your obstacle, it's going to be uncomfortable. <laughs> but if you have the Comforter with you, your discomfort will be addressed by God's comforter and and you will be given what you need and what you need is to grow in endurance and strength and focus on following the will of God and those who simply focus on getting the things that make them comfortable may have uh, great powers of concentration and and great uh, abilities and talents, but if the only one that they serve is themselves, that is completely hollow. If there is no God at your center, yep. uh, you are a, you are a hollow shell of a human being. So that's how, you know, how, how do I, I applaud that? I'll say amen. <laughs> I, I look at that, you know, I wish so much that, that I had been in a situation to receive more of, of, of that teaching when I was the age that a lot of the children up in, in Muncie who are attending this church are, you mm -hmm. know, to receive a, that teaching at their age uh, is, is an extraordinary opportunity. They can, uh, they can uh, begin, begin spiritually. They can begin their lives where I am ending on. What a wonderful opportunity. <clears throat> but you have an opportunity with your technology to promote this. Well, that minister wouldn't, maybe. Just, you know. Well, what I what I did, <clears throat> what I did. Yes, John, you're exactly right. What I did, something that I have learned how to do. Yeah, there you go. And, and I, I consider myself a sort of a digital disciple of Christ. I am limited. I can't go out and be with people in person for several reasons. But what I can do and did uh, for that sermon was I watched it online before I watched my church online. Mm -hmm. And both of them I posted to my Facebook page. My Facebook page has uh, over 5,000 followers. Now, 
not all of them are going to see that or watch it, but it is out there on the internet and available. And, uh, and I will post, uh, I also posted it uh, to a couple of groups that I manage, a, a group page, two groups and a page. One is in Africa. Uh, uh, it's Friends of Ebenezer Hosanna Ministries. It's a church in Africa that God led me to through extraordinary extraordinary steps. It's, and uh, the other is a church that, that I attended most of my life, a Presbyterian church, that was shut down. Uh, but I had started a uh, uh, Facebook group for that, for discussion and information for the church. I The group is still active. It still has people, a few people that were connected to the church itself. And I will post our conversation there. And there may be one or two that will listen to that and realize that that our church is still alive in our hearts that that uh and that the word of god is still coming to us from from other uh from a church in muncie uh from my faith uh, uh presbyterian church here in uh, indianapolis and from you <laughs> then in this conversation and, and now, what church is it that you're attending again? Well, my church is uh, uh, Sister uh, Elizabeth Seton, Catholic Church. Elizabeth Seton. And you have you have quite a journey as to how you got there. Yes. <clears throat> what is your path of faith? Well, I was... <clears throat> Raised a Methodist in a very evangelical um, hellfire brimstone church. Uh, the minister, he was there about 12 years in this one church, which is a little unusual, I think, for Methodists. And um, I was 12 years. <laughs> and uh, so a lot of what he preached was I'm sure evangelical, but I didn't necessarily pick up on, I didn't understand it, a lot of that. But I, but the moral, you don't do this, you don't do that, and you don't do this, da, 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 all that, you know. And I became, I was very moral, and my parents were. And uh, I really didn't know Jesus Christ in a sense of what I find later. So I had an uncle who said, you got to read the New Testament, you got to read the Bible. Read the New well, my mother uh, exposed me to a lot of the Old Testament stories, which children enjoy, and uh, that was my extent of understanding the Bible, except for what I learned from the uh, parish, the church, and they always had the, uh, Methodist Church had the Apostles' Creed, and they had the uh, scriptures, and this is a great preacher, as far as this guy who was a very dynamic preacher. But anyway, uh, I followed what my, I was about 17 years of age, and my uncle kept prompting me. So I thought, well, I've never read the New Testament, and so I'm going to start reading it. So I started reading Matthew, first book of the New Testament, right? Well, Christ opened up to me that, uh, well, I, I may say that before that, I thought, Jesus, well, he's a human being like anybody else. Why, why all this about Jesus? Jesus Christ. And so I started reading the Sermon on the Mount and so forth and so on. And I know Christ came over to me, a powerful way, the portrait, the portrait, and then as of course there's death and resurrection. Well, uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful portrait that changed me. I was called right there. Uh, St. Francis uh, dropped everything and followed Christ literally. When I guess his father was rich and all that sort of thing, and even the bishop, he went out and followed where Christ, wherever he would have him go. Well, I was tempted to do that, but that was too big a step for me. I was in St. Francis. 
but I was into music, played the big bands, uh, wanted to be a jazz musician, and so forth and so on. And uh, but I was pulled into that a tug away way or there, uh, and so I, I I couldn't escape that. So finally, after struggling one way or another, I did want to follow the uh, <clears throat> the calling, and gradually. Uh, left the music behind and um, then uh, finished, well, let's see, when I was still um, uh, playing in the bands, I met my wife and we played uh, in dances and there's a, this was at the, um, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where I lived at that time, my parents lived, before that I was always from Indianapolis and then in Fort Wayne, my father was went up there according to business reasons. Anyway, I graduated high school there. And so we played a lot of the big bands, uh, jobs uh, in northern Indiana uh, and uh, in, in Fort Wayne. So I met my wife there. And then um, still played in the bands and so forth. And then finally, why uh, I was, it was a time of Billy Graham in California. And then there was, they had a, a city crusade in Fort Wayne at that time. And uh, I was enamored by this particular evangelical preacher. And um, and so this sort of pushed me over, he, very much evangelical. And then uh, <clears throat> finished uh, the year there at a Bible school there in Fort Wayne. And then my wife and I wanted to go to California, move there anyway. And so I went out there and then finished college there and then got that out of my system, came back to Indiana and uh, took a pastor in a Methodist church, uh, what you call a student pastor. So I would be a minister to a, a rural, more than one church, uh, two churches at a time, rural churches, and uh, lived there. And then four days a week went to seminary in Indianapolis. And then, uh, which seminary, John? CTS, CTS. And then I, uh, when I was in California, though, uh, I it was an Episcopal church there, and it was Anglo-Catholic. You know what I mean, Anglo-Catholic? It's a high church Episcopal because they they're yeah. very Protestant as well. Low yeah. church, high church. Yes. Well. We went into this liturgical. Well, I heard it. Listen to this guy on the TV again. <laughs> TV, not there's a radio, and uh, it was so marvelous. This man, he has certain ways of interlocking and preaching and teaching and all. So anyway, I had to go hear this man, and I had a good friend who was even telling he went to Fuller Seminary, and then we um, went to to watch him. And anyway. In the service, it was so beautiful, holy, uh, reverent, and there was George Orroyd Mass, uh, and it touched me deeply. And there was a crucifix above the rude screen, and the service was beautiful, holy, beautiful, uh, and it touched me because the evangelical was sort of, I always says, too slick. <laughs> to me, even though it lacked that awe, the wonderful, the beauty of worship. And I, I was touched by that. And so we contacted that um, priest and he, then I was going back to the Methodist uh, 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 missions in, 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 in Indiana, uh, Indiana, going to seminary. And then um, uh, my my old friend, my friend from Florida, he went on and he became a Episcopal priest and went into Indian missions. And I went on the other way. And then I had two years as a Methodist uh, pastor, student pastor. My third year, I was a lay reader in the Episcopal church in a little mission there that I helped build in Noblesville, Indiana. I think that mission's still there, or I think it's probably church now. It's uh, up at uh, Geist, uh, Morse Reservoir, Morse Reservoir, St. Michael's. 
Then the third uh, year, uh, uh, the third year I was ordained and then I was Episcopal priest and was pastor of a new mission uh, in Speedway at that time. And I was there a good five years. But uh, it can be you know, a lot of problems and tensions between the Anglo Catholic point of view and the uh, evangelical point of view. And so I uh, uh, was felt led to the Catholic Church then finally, and I've been Catholic since then. Um, and then being married, I, of course, would not be a priest at that time. Later on, it worked out. Not for me, but then for other, uh, well, the last day, decade or two, possibly. Anyway, but I was, first I did social work, took a year up at uh, Loyola University in Chicago, came back and uh, got not only seminary and CTS, also a uh, master's. And then I was, after doing some social work, I did par partly, uh, part-time anyway, even afterward, but I went to uh, opened up that I would teach in Marion University, you know, Catholic school. I was there 25 years, and I was uh, level raised the level of associate pastor and uh, associate uh, professor, and I retired in '90. I went to Florida and uh, did work down meditation work, did uh, Silva meditation. <laughs> Uh, went some cooling schooling with that and um, did church work, uh, worked for the schools down there, the GED programs, uh, and then lay Eucharistic minister in the Our Lady of Lords Catholic Church. And with the I, the I taught classes down there a little bit like I do now, where we would um, uh, have open discussion. Bible started with Bible and open discussion pretty much, and uh, was there about five years. and came back to Indiana, and I started with St. Luke's Catholic Church, teaching scripture there, and then later on up to uh, um, Mother Seton now, and I've taught their scripture for a while, and then resuming as I advanced in age, and I've been doing that for about three or four years. And we have Hallelujah. about eight or nine people now, uh, rather regular. The, the Zoom meeting that you do, now, is that recorded or not? No, we don't record. We haven't recorded. That's uh, We aren't up on the technology like you would be, you see. Would you record it if you had access to the, if you could... If well, that's could. something that's something we could ask the uh, the group whether they would like to do that. that that's a, an option well, we can thought well, about. Doing. What I'm thinking is is uh, is this a group that wants to operate strictly in person and not share, particularly outside the group, in terms of uh, uh, using it as a <clears throat> tool, or would you? Well, know? they they are all. They are all Catholic. However, they've already said, too, that other people would certainly be welcome. Uh, but the main themes are but it's very Christian. Otherwise, I mean, it, it doesn't exclude anyone just about. Uh, of course, the, the system, there is there are the boundaries of Catholicism, which is very, you know, phasey um, in a lot of ways. But there's a there's a core of orthodoxy which uh, we would all hold to pretty much, and so uh, the continuity. Well, I don't want to go too much into the Catholic point here, but um, uh, certainly we'd be inviting anyone else. So um, I, I'd have to talk to them about that whether they want to in, include other people or not. That's a good question. Well, my, and, my my primary question is yeah. Well, is what what do you do inside your group? Do you focus on on scripture, prayer, uh, discussion? How do you work? Well, sometimes it depends on uh, from the group. 
But I would say most of the time I guide it, but it can jet off in another direction very quickly and easily. And often it's right now we're dealing with conscience, the topic of conscience. And so uh, that in, for a Catholic, the highest authority is the individual conscience. Guided, though, by the church. But 